This is a hunt across the Mongolian steppe where it veers towards the Soviet border. But it's not anything living that we are pursuing today. Our search is for one of the undiscovered killing grounds of the 20th century. The hunt ends in a valley of bones. These are the skulls of massacre victims, all of them Buddhist Lamas, as monks were called in Mongolia. Fifty years ago, on a dusty morning in Ulaanbaatar, the Mongolian capital, the communist despot who ordered these killings sped to a cabinet meeting. His name was Choibalsan. He terrorized this nation for 17 years. Comrade Marshal Choibalsan, though totally unknown in the West, was the Pol Pot of his time. He liquidated one of Asia's fabulous religions, destroying or emptying 700 monasteries, killing up to 100,000 people. Choibalsan had them all murdered, shot through the head. The legacy today of this protege of Stalin is a nation haunted by its past. Though their country is shackled by the burden of modern treachery on a Shakespearean scale, half of Mongolia's two million people thrive in exactly the same sort of semi-nomadic style as their forebears. It's still true that only the fittest survive, but the Mongols have adapted wonderfully to the hardships of the grasslands. There are two million horses wandering the Mongolian steppe, which is as large as the whole of Western Europe. To these rugged people, there is but one national hero. He was called Genghis Khan. Seven centuries ago, this obscure chieftain united the Mongols and led them to world domination, which is celebrated in this new Mongolian feature film. The mighty Khan and his descendants conquered both China and Russia. Their cruel and fearless horse warriors who reached the gates of Vienna aroused the same sort of fear as nuclear weapons in our own time. But then history tired of the Mongols' martial antics and forgot them. Today, Genghis Khan's capital, Karakorum, is a melancholy place. It's hard to believe that this drab community once inspired the Golden Horde, whose monuments were severed heads and ruined cities. As Mongol power shriveled, so China moved in. For four centuries, Mongolia was under the dragon throne's harsh control. The Mongols were assigned a familiar role as the prisoners of their own geopolitical fate, pinioned between Imperial Russia and China to the south. In the first years of the 20th century, Mongolia was at rock bottom. Poverty-stricken, racked by universal syphilis, exploited both by China and the Mongols' own corrupt Buddhist lamas and aristocracy.
revolution came to Mongolia as China itself began to implode. <laughs> In 1921, in a war that saw one of the world's last cavalry charges, the Moscow Bolsheviks intervened. The Red Army was sent to Mongolia. The Bolsheviks placed a handful of Mongol radicals in power. In the shadow of Moscow, this became Asia's first communist state. The novice Marxists who invaded bound themselves ever closer to the newly formed Soviet Union, turning their back on a chaotic China and a predatory Japan. If you look at the map, uh, you see that Mong Mongolia is almost entirely isolated from the world. It has China on the south, it has the Soviet Union on the north. Uh, at the time we're talking about, China was hostile, the Japanese were an aggressive nation, and were probing into Mongolia uh, militarily. The only friend they had uh, was the Soviet Union. Today the capital bears a name resonant with revolutionary fervor, Ulan Bata, which means Red Hero. For decades this was the 16th Republic of the Soviet Union in all but name. Ulan Bata was the most servile of Moscow's allies. Just as dutifully, it followed the Soviet lead when the moment came for political change. Encouraged by the Gorbachev reforms, Mongolia's democracy activists came out of the woodwork early last year demonstrating in the paralyzing cold of midwinter they called for the end of the old order gradually in the months that followed the revolutionary party made a series of concessions that in theory mark the end of its supremacy recently it recast itself as the mongolian people's party Stalin, who had manipulated Mongolian politics for his own sinister aims, made an inglorious exit from his pedestal in Ulaanbaatar, an event that took place late at night because the ruling party hoped to minimize the fuss. Mongolia's communists had ruled from behind closed doors, our search began in room 29 at the Interior Ministry, in other words, the secret police. We're the first Westerners allowed to see these archives of the firing squads and the gulags of the Choibalsan tyranny, thousands of files in numbered racks. Most Mongol families lost at least one relative during that terror. But it's only now, 50 years later, that the Mongols themselves are allowed limited access to learn where and when their loved ones were put to death. It's reckoned that one-tenth of the population of this country perished on the homicidal orders of Stalin and Choibalsan. These are files on 17,000 murdered lamas. Over 40,000 were executed when the ruling Revolutionary Party set out to liquidate its great ideological rival, the Lamist Faith. They died in 1937 and 38. Many were killed on the orders of Stalin's secret police, the NKVD. This document shows Russian instructions written in the corner overruling orders issued by Mongolia's security service. A Soviet propaganda team shot this film to show modernity, here in the form of personal hygiene reaching the peasants. The film brought home a simple message, do as the Russians do. 
by the early 1930s, all major policy and security decisions had to have Moscow sanction. According to the official lies, this was a land of milk and honey, rather than a marginal region on the wrong side of Siberia. It showed Mongols building houses to replace their nomadic tents. The traditional Mongol language was replaced by the Russian Cyrillic script. For the Soviets, it was a self-appointed colonial task of shouldering the white man's burden. That was one of the purposes of the revolution. Uh, to destroy Mongolia's old, old culture and to make it appear that there had been no culture until the great light of communism had dawned in Mongolia. Works of art were burned or thrown away, books were burned. Um, at that time it was dangerous to be uh, an intellectual, it was dangerous to, uh, to be able to uh, read the old Mongol language, uh, it was even dangerous to, to know foreign languages. The totem of this brave new world was a foreign god, Stalin. In Mongolia, the worship of the Soviet dictator faithfully followed the Moscow line, promoting his infallibility. The chief sycophant in Ulaanbaatar was Marshal Troibelson, who, like his Soviet patron, had spent time as a boy in a monastery. In both men, it may have spurred murderous instincts towards religion. With Soviet approval, Choibelson launched his own personality cult, amassing all the top jobs, from Prime Minister to Foreign Minister, Interior Minister and War Minister, apart from naming himself Commander-in-Chief. He pulled this off by executing his fellow leaders, civilian and military, on false treason charges. All artistic and cultural life served to praise dear comrade Choibelson. He named a city after himself. The theatre became a stage for castigating those who showed anything short of godlike devotion. <laughs> It was the Buddhist faith that provided the one challenge to Choibelson's authority. Though many high lamas had been justly criticised for their venal and depraved ways, a majority of Mongols were true believers. There were over 80,000 lamas in the monasteries, all venerating as their god king the Dalai Lama in distant Tibet, which exported its spiritual beliefs to Mongolia. Choibelson's next attempt to eliminate the influence of religion was to get Stalin's NKVD to produce an anti-clerical propaganda film. The film sought to convince the Mongol peasantry that their lamas were arrogant, corrupt, inconsiderate. They lived off livestock handed over by peasantry the lamas eat and drink with gusto. They were shown to be no better than ravenous dogs. A 
Under duress, the Lamas were forced to defecate together outside the monastery as the cameras rolled. A child Lama, believed by the faithful to be a living reincarnation of a Buddhist master, was shown giving the boot to submissive devotees. The film is wonderfully shot by one of Eisenstein's contemporaries, but its purpose is manipulative. We found these documents in the secret police archive. It shows Choibelson was ready to launch his final solution against the monasteries. Choibelson personally wrote to the head of the Soviet secret police in 1936, saying he was fulfilling their tasks, arresting and executing lamas. In later documents, he gave exact numbers and categories every time a group of Buddhist lamas were shot on his orders. His signature appears on the reports. Practically every monastery in Mongolia was destroyed or abandoned. These are the ruins of the Manshir Monastery in central Mongolia. But here, there are signs of change. When the government loosened its reins over religion a year ago, plans were drawn up to rebuild. On the ruins of the old, a new central temple will be constructed. Soon, more than a hundred lamas hope to return here. Nearby, the old men from Manshir, the few who survived the killing, have again donned their lamist robes. <laughs> Most of these men were in their teens or early twenties when Choibelson's secret police arrived. The young lamas were imprisoned rather than executed. Last year they began practicing their faith again in a tent, a makeshift monastery. They'd spent the last 50 years as herdsmen, their robes and scriptures hidden from the government. The Lamas told us what happened the night the secret police came. <laughs> it was the presence of Soviet NKVD squads alongside Stalin's Red Army which enabled Choibelson to finish off the Lamas. <laughs> Tomorrow, 
The gold and silver treasure was taken from the monasteries to be melted down for the state. The mythical monsters of Buddhism were hauled from the temples and smashed one by one. A few were taken off to Leningrad as Soviet plunder. There's hardly a corner of Mongolia which was not touched by the terror. Today, though some of Choibelson's hatchet men are still alive, no effort is made to bring them to book. This frail-looking pensioner, living in squalor, ostracized by his neighbors because of the blood on his hands, personally put 15,724 people to death. Their show trials, as counter-revolutionaries, took place in Ulan Bata's central theatre. A hand-picked audience heard false accusations that lamas had been spying for Imperial Japan. Mongolia's propaganda outlets depicted Choi Bulsan as a loving father teaching his son how to shoot because of the growing threat to their benefactor, Stalin, from Nazi Germany. But in reality, Choi Bulsan, who was frequently drunk, even surpassed Stalin in brutish, outlandish actions when it came to life and death. Now, after 50 years of silence and frequently fraudulent official history, the victims of Choi Bulsan are mutely reappearing. This is a mass grave we found near the town of Moran in northwest Mongolia. The search team with us had time to unearth eight skulls and other remains 
before the weather turned wintry. These are fragments of the saffron robes of lamas murdered in 1939. They came from a nearby monastery. Government officials estimate another 5,000 skeletons lie under this sandy soil, gradually being exposed by the winds from Siberia. Among Mongolia's present leaders, there's no enthusiasm for finding the murderers. Хэлмэгдүүлж <laughs> Given the smallness of the elite, it's inevitable that many party cadres with a murky past are still in or on the edge of power. On National Day, Mongolian leaders have yet to be weaned away from a troublesome style march past in the capital he created. The dictator's stamp is all around. Dressed as a civilian, Choi Bolsan even built the grandiose revolutionary square. This was how his courtiers recorded it for posterity as he worked with his eventual successor, Serumbol, another tyrant, but one who was marginally less baleful. When the Lenin Club went up in the 1940s, after the Second World War, Mongolia had become one of the world's most closed societies, shutting out, with Stalin's approval, all contact with the West. Every few months, a Kremlin bully boy, on this visit a youthful comrade Brezhnev, would drop by to make sure the Mongols were still being obedient. Moscow's greed didn't stop there. Even as late as the 1950s, Soviet leaders were annexing Mongolian territory unilaterally forcing the Mongols to sign unequal border treaties. That Pandora's box of potential disputes has yet to be opened. But now, with an attempt at dignity, the Soviets are abandoning Mongolia. The armor divisions that were at battle readiness during the Sino-Soviet confrontation 20 years ago are being recalled to an empire that has lost its will. <laughs> Among the exotica they're leaving is a fleet of Antonov biplanes. these days used to carry mail around the step. We charted one, secure in the knowledge other planes were unlikely to be flying because there's hardly any fuel available. The Antonov cruises at the speed of a slow saloon car. We hopped over the mountains south of the capital to a Soviet Air Force nuclear base 
abandoned a few months ago. First, it was necessary to ensure that all the wild horses had crossed the runway. With that final low-level check completed, it was time to wake up the Mongol Air Force. They arrive by bike, friendly enough, but non plus to see, of all things, an aeroplane. Just imagine that during the decades of the Cold War, this base was targeted for annihilation, keyed into the computer boards of the Chinese missile system across the border, and almost certainly the Pentagon's as well. Here, it was a Soviet finger that was on the nuclear trigger. Lenin's time had come and gone. Now the Mongols hoped to turn this concrete emptiness into an international airport. But other socialist dinosaurs, especially around Ulaanbaatar itself, are less easy to transform. This is the Soviet-built number three power station. It provides a vital part of the capital's power and heating. But like similar plants nearby, this power station is perpetually on the brink of failure. The basic problem, apart from its out-of-date technology, is there are no spare parts. And since January, the Soviets have demanded hard currency payments for all goods, something the Mongols haven't got. Giant, broken components are everywhere. This is the coldest capital in the world, a place of extremes, where icicles can suddenly sprout in the middle of summer. So the coming power station crisis frightens those in charge. There's a Heath Robinson heating system with huge pipes already cracked and corroding, wastefully taking warmth, literally, across roads. A communal heating system reaching the apartment blocks where over half the capital's people live. Өнөөдрийн байлдар манай цахилгаан станц 200,000 тонн үрс нөөцлөх хэвээр. Гэтлэд байт байдлаар дөнгөж 50,000 тонн үрс нөөцтэй байна. За хамгийн гол чадах юм бол одоо уурхайн гол нүр ирүүлж чадахгүй байна. Хэрвээ ямар нэгэн байлдар манай цахилгаан станц оцох юм бол Улаанбаатар хотын 30 гаруй хувь нь цахилгаан дулаанг болно. Өөрөөр хэм бол ихэнхэн одоо хүмүүс бол даарна гэсэн үг. Хэрвээ даарах юм бол өвчин аав нь Өвчин авах юм бол мэдээж ойлгомжтой одоо ардтмын хөдөлмөрчд одоо хөл аюул очно л гэсэн үг. Ийм л юм болох юм байна. If winter kills when the deep freeze begins, it's the nomads still over half of Mongolia's population who'll be best placed to cope. These are tinkers allowed to freely roam again now that the rigid control of the party has collapsed. With it has gone the interference of Soviet advisers, anxious to keep Mongols away from Moscow's network of secret military bases. <laughs> Every week now, the Trans-Siberian Express carries batches of Soviet advisers away from Mongolia. Many are bitter, complaining that their once submissive ally has turned against them. We joined one party of disconsolate construction workers, including women house painters. 
только приехала, вот поработала, что заработали, то они все вынесли с квартиры. И нам ничего не вернули. Так и осталось на этом. Никакой за нам защиты, ничего нет. Как это так? Они должны нам что-нибудь довернуть, хоть половину. Вот так, что ж тут? Обидели нас сразу прям. Ничего хорошего нет, честно. In Central Asia, this Soviet exodus really is a turning point in history. But if the Russian bear is withdrawing north, the Chinese dragon to the south is stirring. The Chinese already rule three million Mongols in what's called Inner Mongolia. It's a border region which remained under Peking's control when the bulk of Mongolia was freed from Chinese domination 80 years ago. Now, Mongols have deep-rooted suspicions about the ambitions of their old overlords. We travel to Zarmenuda, where Mongolia's border patrol, until recently under Soviet supervision, stands alone guarding Mongolia's boundaries. Just after dawn, in the eastern Gobi Desert, a Mongol frontier patrol crosses the railway line that links Peking and Moscow. They're on the lookout for smugglers, and given Peking's sensitivities, any Mongol nationalists trying to export democratic reforms to their brethren to the south. Now the rise of Mongol nationalism plus the start of multi-party democracy and a Buddhist religious revival deeply worry the aging communist leaders in China. That's why they've ordered an internal crackdown against their own Mongol dissident leaders on their side of the border. On Mongolian territory, there are watchtowers dotted along the 2,600 mile border. But such is its immensity that short of deploying every one of Mongolia's two million people along it, the frontier can't be adequately protected. It was here, over 50 years ago, that the marauding Japanese Imperial Army, which had already seized the whole of northeast China, launched a series of cross-border raids. For Tokyo, too, has dreamed of controlling the vastness of Mongolia. <laughs> Nowadays, the electrified border fence claims a few wild victims. Otherwise, it's a case of have gun, will travel. No recruit will be accepted by Mongolia's frontier force unless he can ride everything that can be saddled. In the eastern Gobi, Bactrian camels, with their ability to go for days without water, give added edge to this nation's token defences as the Mongols search for their own identity after the decades of being smothered by the Soviets. One piece of the Mongol jigsaw lies well to the southwest, beyond the mountains of heaven, in Tibet, which is now a reluctant part of communist China. It's from once independent Tibet that Buddhist beliefs spread to Mongolia more than 400 years ago.
Unexpectedly, during our assignment in Mongolia, the exiled Tibetan leader, the Dalai Lama, came to Ulaanbaatar. The faithful who survive Marshal Troibelson still revere the Dalai Lama as a living god and head of the church. Born again Buddhism materialized in front of us. But in the half century since this same holy man assumed his spiritual duties, most of the old rituals have been stamped out and forgotten in Mongolia. For the Dalai Lama, the spontaneous welcome here kindles hope of an eventual return to his beloved Tibet. Though Peking's repressive rule there borrows extensively from Choibelson's manual of intolerance in Mongolia. Now the faith remains very, very strong. In their eye, see some the tear. See, many of them, you see, crying. I myself also become very emotional. You see, uh, in my eyes also is a tear. Tibetan and Mongolia, in both cases, Buddhism is almost like the life of the national. So the dis destruction of Buddhism means the whole, the life of the nation, you see, uh, I say, uh, destroy it. Destruction never I would say, uh, eliminate the genuine Buddhist faith. It lives. Yes. Now, under such difficult circumstances, now Buddhist faith remains very strongly in Mongolia. Now in Tibet also, it's very strong. It is surely one of history's blackest modern jokes that Marshal Choibelson himself who died in Moscow, of fair means or foul we shall never know, is regarded by some myopic Mongols as a patriotic hero who resisted Soviet annexation. He was given an epic send-off on the orders of the dying Stalin. Then the coffin of one of the most odious thugs ever to rule a nation was carried through a picturesque snowstorm to the waiting Trans-Siberian Express. In Mongolia, there were grotesque scenes as citizens wept to order. Celluloid moments that have forever captured the Orwellian absurdity of an entire nation acting out one despot charades even after his death. As for Choi Bolsan's accomplice, Stalin, his monolith lies in a makeshift coffin, in fact a wooden container outside the state central library here. It's probably still intact because no one's had the nerve to break it up yet. But Stalin remains a useful scapegoat for those Mongols anxious to blame others, foreigners, above all Soviets for the sins of their fathers. Disney <laughs> 
хийсэн үйлч би аль алин би тийм л одоо эсрэг тэсрэг утаа одоо тийм л нэг хувь хүнэлтэй Despite such ambivalence, the state itself has made a token step, laying this memorial stone and appointing what's called the Presidential Commission for Victims of the Repression. Among the survivors gathered here were men who had suffered Choibelson's arbitrary sentences. There's General Zolman, who spent seven years in the gulags, accused of being a traitor. Haidav, the Lama, who only avoided execution because his name was spelt wrongly on the death list. And the editor of the party newspaper, Six of his colleagues who stood trial alongside him were shot. Nearby, just a few yards away, stands Choibelson's statue. The victims of his paranoid purges wonder why the great and the not-so-good of Mongolia's tiny elite are unconcerned that the tyrant still has an honored place in this capital This old lama of 73 saw his elders dragged off to be shot. Now, beside a mass grave, he performs a purification rite to release their souls. Under the soil, 5,000 more await redemption. The death knell has sounded for the Kafkaesque labyrinth of evil Moscow foisted on these unworldly descendants of Genghis Khan. Now democracy is at hand with all its frustrations. For Mongolia, this is the hour of metamorphosis. <laughs>